Good morning, everyone. If you're in an AM time zone, and good afternoon if you're in a PM time zone, welcome to the new season of the NAI Director Seminar. I am really, really pleased that we can kick off the seminar series uh, this year. Uh, I, I still think as an academic, obviously, the year starts in September. But then again, the federal fiscal year starts in October, so we're pretty close to that, too. So whatever new year you want, we've got it. And Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is coming up, so it's New Year all the way around. So at any rate, uh, it's a real pleasure to have Norm sleep with us. He's right here at NAI Central to present this morning's seminar. Uh, Norm, as I think most of you know, is a professor of geophysics at Stanford University. He is a very, very distinguished member of the science community and of the NAI. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of most of the professional societies that you can think of, the AAAS, the Geological Society of America, and the American Geophysical Union. He's won a fistful of medals. I won't try to uh, list them all. Uh, his uh, educational background uh, includes Michigan State and then Master's and Ph.D. in Geophysics from MIT. And Norm is going to be speaking with us this morning about a topic that he's been working on lately and talked about at AbSicon, which is the habitability of super-Earths, many of which we anticipate discovering in the next few years. And Norm, take it away. Okay. The, the interest in... Uh, super Earth comes about uh, simply since science is like uh, the uh, drunk looking for lost car keys that looks under the lamppost where it can see. Uh, we obviously have a sampling bias of when we find silicate planets around another star, uh, we're going to be more apt to find uh, large ones than small ones. Uh, the tectonics, uh, especially if we can concentrate on what uh, may be observable at a distance, and the habitability of these objects are of interest. Uh, we have the Earth and Mars, a small silicate planet, uh, to provide at least uh, some analogy and comparison. Okay, uh, there are basically three uh, things you need in the recipe uh, for habitability. You can't be too hot or too cold especially if we consider habitability that can be observed at a distance. Uh, we have to have rock cycles that are active uh, so we don't end up with Mars where essentially all the volatile elements are in the subsurface or <laughs> Venus uh, where they're all in the atmosphere. And we need some source of chemical disequilibrium uh, so the biota can have lunch. Okay, uh, what is uh, bad uh, for life uh, concentrating on super-Earths? Uh, we can end up uh, creating too much nebular gas. Uh, this is detectable, particularly in transit. Uh, we have Neptune as an example in our own solar system. Uh, we can also get too close to the star. Uh, Venus is an example. Uh, we can get outside the habitable zone. Uh, this kind of renders the object uninhabitable at the surface, uh, but probably habitable in the subsurface. It just becomes hard to detect uh, traditionally uninhabitable, uh, but non-traditionally habitable. Pushing the wrong button. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, is bad. We need uh, geochemical cycles, as I've already mentioned, and going to concentrate us on in the talk. Uh, Mars is something uh, where uh, this has happened. Asteroid impacts occur infrequently, but they can spoil your day. And we can end up with a planet-wide ocean, which I'll discuss also. We can end up with water world, and I'll show this as a probable fate of a super-Earth. Uh, I can get different life than on the Earth, but not necessarily that. Okay, uh, we've had a couple papers recently on plate tectonics and super-Earth. Uh, Valencia et al. concluded it was likely, O'Neill and Lenardi concluded uh, it was highly unlikely. 
uh, I'm going to uh, simplify the math and the derivations. Things become phenomenally simple if you use gravity rather than mass as a scaling power. You don't have to carry around mass to all kinds of fractional powers. I'm going to derive uh, both the Valencia and Lenardic, uh, Neo and Lenardic results, some others. I'm going to illustrate the assumptions. I'm going to avoid tidally heated planets. Uh, there was a paper on this at Absicon. Uh, but tides are going to make the planet inside hotter and more vigorous, uh, probably uh, possibly lead uh, to abundant surface volcanism, uh, which will also give us geochemical cycles. Okay, if we use gravity as a size parameter, uh, we use Gauss's law. We have the other advantage is that gravity for large planets scales uh, to the square root rather than cube root of uh, mass. So a 10 Earth mass planet will have about three times the gravity of the Earth. Uh, Mars, which is about a 10 Earth mass planet, will have about four tenths. So we have a parameter that for the range of planets that we consider habitable uh, is not going to vary a lot. Uh, this will also uh, lead to some simplification. Okay, we have Gauss's law uh, for gravity, uh, the gravitational flux uh, from an object. Is this getting a pointer or not? It is. It is not. Uh, uh, is uh, equal to four times g times the mass of the planet. Uh, the equilibrium heat flow has the same type of formula. Uh, the equilibrium heat flow is the minimum heat flow an object can have uh, where it will cool down rather than heat up. A uh, uh, planet during its history can only cool a few hundred K from when it's extremely hot and basically fully molten at the surface to where it's too cold for having any serious tectonics. Uh, so a heat flow being crudely imbalanced with radioactivity is something that will give us a scaling assumption. And uh, we can uh, combine these uh, and uh, get that the radioactive heat flow uh, is, again, uh, depending on the mass of the planet. And uh, we have... Uh, something uh, that's observable uh, for the Earth, gravity uh, for an object, if we can determine uh, both its size and diameter is observable, and uh, the balance here will reflect a long-lasting state of the planet, that uh, the planet cools extremely fast at, during and after accretion, cools extremely fast at any kind of moon-forming impact, but cools slowly at that kind of 50, 100 K per billion years of that order, and hence uh, a crude balance between heat flow and radioactivity observed is long-lasting, and if we look at a random planet, we're going to see it in its long-lasting state uh, rather than a state that's in relatively briefly. Okay, we get some simple uh, scaling formulas out of this. <coughs> Uh, lithostatic pressure increases proportional to gravity. Uh, density, this is the near surface density. It's not going to vary much for silicate planets. Uh, the geotherm relative to the surface temperature is proportional uh, to the uh, heat flow from the planet and hence proportional to the heat flow from radioactivity. Again, increases with depth and is inversely proportional to conductivity. This is a rock property that's not going to vary much. Uh, the surface temperature, if we stick with habitable planets, is not uh, far from the freezing point of water. And uh, we can write uh, uh, the geotherm here uh, in terms of uh, uh, pressure and this means that if we uh, plot things as a petrologist, the pressure 
temperature geotherm is going to be to the first order invariant to planetary size. If you have a pressure temperature geotherm for the Earth, it will work on Mars, it will work on the super Earth to the first order. It will depend on the amount of radioactivity in the planet, which will, of course, decrease as it's used up during its history. Uh, but if we go at a particular point in the evolution of a planet, uh, we have the same pressure temperature grid. Okay. Uh, we get other useful scalings from this. Uh, the pressure at the base of all of the lithosphere um, where we, the maximum depth that the planet is dominated for projection is going to be invariant of planetary size. Uh, we have a, on the uh, plot here, uh, we have a temperature pressure grid uh, for the melding of basalt. Uh, the, if we have a given uh, temperature in the interior, the pressure uh, where melding starts is going to be invariant of uh, planetary size. A big super Earth may be hotter. We put in a hotter uh, thing here and we'll get uh, melting at a greater depth and more total melting. The points B and C are the points where the total amount uh, melt generated in a column equals the depth and that will be the depth of the uh, top of the mantle at the base of the ocean crust. If we plot anything else here uh, that's pressure dependent. Thickness of oceanic crust uh, depends on the pressure of where melting starts and hence uh, will uh, uh, scale uh, inversely with gravity. Uh, thickness of continental crust, the driving force, as we'll see later, to make continental crust from the uh, 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 ridge uh, uh, will scale. Uh, such that the uh, thickness of continental crust will scale with the thickness of lithosphere. The thickness of hydrothermally altered crust scales with the pressure to close cracks. And uh, if we uh, plot a column here with the zone of hydrothermal alteration, basaltic crust, uh, the depleted uh, mantle melts heavily in the base of the lithosphere. Uh, that uh, diagram at a given interior temperature will be invariant of planetary size. So, uh, what we learned about the Earth carries through. One caveat is that the super Earth in the interior may be hotter, uh, but then it will be like the Earth uh, early in its history when the interior is hotter. We get a good analogy here, and uh, we learn a lot fairly quick. Uh, there's a, a second scaling here uh, that's even more universal. Uh, to cool material, you'll have to circulate it through the thermal boundary layer of the lithosphere. Uh, this is true of any large convecting object. Uh, the, uh, the scaling with another proportionality constant uh, would be true if we had a volcanically cooled planet where the material erupts. It has to erupt to cool. Uh, we lose all the heat rather than just some in the lithosphere, so there's a different proportionality constant. So this time uh, to circulate material, form continental crust, uh, circulate material through the ridge axis where we melt, have material end up in the ocean crust, produce enough volatiles to recycle the ocean, uh, 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 take material through the reservoir that forms hydrothermally altered crust. All of this is invariant of planetary size, and this invariance will depend on the cooling mechanism, uh, but is again uh, there, and we, we're dealing here uh, with circulating material through the lithosphere, the current scale time uh, being a couple billion years for the Earth, uh, the scale time for anything else being uh, the age of the Earth or somewhat greater. Okay, we need uh, now to consider the tectonic uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, any large object has to cool uh, by, conduct by convection. 
Uh, conduction can dominate near the surface, but the interior is simply uh, too big uh, to cool over the regional age of the planet. Uh, Valencia's uh, group, uh, uh, she balances uh, uh, mantle-wide uh, uh, forces and shows these are greater uh, than the lithospheric uh, uh, forces, and hence uh, will have convection where it's controlled by the rate of the slab sink in the mantle. Uh, O'Neill and Lenardic have models that effectively consider only forces in the lithosphere, even though they're uh, complicated. And I show analytically that we can get into a state where plate tectonics only occurs in, on Earth-sized planets. I'm going to again use gravity. I'm going to derive results. I'm going to illustrate assumptions. And I've got to come up with a displeasing result uh, that we're too ignorant of the Earth uh, to fully extrapolate. We're going to come up with a pleasing result that if we don't have plate tectonics, the interior is quite hot. We'll still get lots of volcanism. We'll get geochemical cycles. This will affect details, uh, but will not. Uh, affect uh, the fact that we have a geochemically active planet. Okay, uh, the heat flow through the lithosphere uh, depends on this uh, square root of plate age law. It depends on the temperature contrast across the lithosphere, which will vary some, but not a lot. Again, because the planet is too cold, we don't get tectonics. If the planet is too hot, it cools extremely uh, rapidly with a molten surface. Conductivity, thermal diffusivity in the square root are material properties. And we can write this uh, dimensionally, taking the term in the bracket uh, to be uh, the uh, scale thickness of the lithosphere and just getting the simple Fourier conduction formula. Okay, to get subduction to go, uh, we have to have three things to work. The slab has to bend with strains of order one. Uh, the uh, thrust, mega thrust, the boundary between the slab and the arc has to slip. Sometimes slips in great tsunami earthquakes like in Sumatra. It uh, has to slip one way or the other. And the slab has to be able to penetrate uh, into the mantle. And we don't really know on the Earth which one of these is the rate-limiting process. We know that all three have to occur. Okay, to bend uh, 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 the slab, a uh, simple way to model this uh, is that uh, we have a yield stress and a yield stress that acts over the thickness of the lithosphere. And there has to be enough forces either from the buoyancy of the ridge axis or the negative buoyancy of the slab uh, to allow this process to occur. Uh, we also have subduction. This depends on friction. And it depends on friction that's related to a coefficient of friction. Uh, we know the coefficient friction of intact rock. Uh, we don't know the water pressure, P sub W at depth. And I've collected terms in here used that the uh, pressure, the lithostatic uh, pressure, is going to scale uh, with depth. And uh, the scale thickness that this is going to act at is the scale thickness of the lithosphere. Uh, and it's going to uh, depend on gravity uh, linearly. The big point here is we don't know what the water pressure is, so we don't know what this apparent uh, coefficient of friction is, uh, mu apparent. OK. Uh, we can uh, solve uh, uh, for a, a driving uh, force here. Uh, the, uh, we have a driving uh, force uh, that's going to be proportional to the buoyancy of the slab, the buoyancy of the ridge axis, going to be proportional to temperature contrast, proportional gravity, proportional to thermal contraction coefficient. I'm going to 
uh, derive this on a later slide, but this is the classical ridge bush forest. Uh, buoyant material, if it's not, uh, cannot sustain stress, will spread like a fluid, like oil over water. And we're assuming uh, that this buoyancy force for the ridge is driving subduction. If we uh, solve this equation, all the material parameters drop. Uh, everything <laughs> drops out except the temperature contrast across the lithosphere, the apparent coefficient of friction, uh, and the thermal expansion coefficient. If we're trying to get a numerical model this way, we have to tune the numerical model, which O'Neill and Lenardi did. Uh, we cannot uh, solve for the lithospheric thickness as a function of planetary gravity. So kind of a <clears throat> partial inference here is if you tune this to work on the Earth, it won't work on planets that are smaller or larger. Uh, the other point in here is that we know what the thermal expansion coefficient is. We know what the temperature contrast is. We end up with a very small coefficient of friction of around uh, uh, 4 one hundredths. Uh, which is too low to be for any reasonable material, which means that we either need a dynamic weakening mechanism or we need uh, to have a very high fluid pressure probably from subducted sediment. So again, something that we don't know a lot about the Earth. We know the subduction zone is weak on the Earth, but we don't. We know kind of qualitatively why, but certainly not quantitative why. Okay, the second uh, uh, process here I'm going to consider is the slab uh, moving to viscous uh, metal. If we uh, solve uh, the force balance equation between the slab and the resistance of the slab, we get back the classical parameterized <coughs> convection result. The same one will apply to an isoviscous fluid. It applies in this tape because the lithosphere is basically, by assumption, going along for a ride. Uh, we get a very big slab. It's going to be able uh, possibly to overcome uh, uh, forces in the lithosphere like the friction and bending. And all we have to consider is the fact that the slab can sink. Uh, we see that we get gravity to the one-third power here. Uh, we need heat flow proportional to gravity to balance radioactivity. Uh, the parameters here we can change are the temperature contrast uh, at the surface and the viscosity. We increase the temperature in interior, it decreases viscosity, increases this. So we need to, to balance radioactivity with heat flow on the super Earth. We need to have it hotter than the Earth on site. Uh, we get relatively robust results. This is the Valencia et al. result. We have a big slab on a small planet. Uh, we, uh, the tactic here, and just show it here in outline, is that the slab sinks, it drives flow, and the flow if the lithosphere is going along for the ride, if the slab is producing the only driving force, we'll put quite in tension. We get a big enough slab, it's going to overcome any forces uh, in the lithosphere, and the uh, metal is going to be the uh, uh, dominant balance, and we're back to this simple classical parameterized convection result. Okay. Uh, uh, the, again, just to reiterate, uh, we can derive the equation either from force balance or work balance like Valencia et al. does. Uh, uh, the work on the mega thrust and the bending of the slab uh, becomes negligible if we have a big enough slab. Uh, plates become likely. Uh, there's a physical problem with this is that the viscosity increases with depth uh, that the slab may uh, do mainly work uh, deforming the deep metal and not have much work left over to be transmitted uh, to the slab. That the viscosity immediately under the lithosphere may be quite low. Uh, the slab will drive the flow, uh, but the, it'll basically be uh, effectively like ball bearings between the metal and the lithosphere, and the slab may not be able to put the lithosphere in, under compression. 
Uh, a second problem here is if we do a parameterized convection uh, calculation for the Earth and extrapolate back in time, we get into royal trouble. Uh, the current uh, most accepted geochemical uh, uh, estimate for the radioactivity in the Earth would produce uh, an equivalent heat flow of 24 milliwatts per meter squared. The mantle on the east pole is 70 milliwatts per meter squared. So if we believe this, the Earth is cooling at like 180 uh, or over 100 degrees, 100 K per billion years. If we try to extrapolate back in time, uh, we extrapolate it back in time, the mantle's hotter, we have even more vigorous convection, and we extrapolate, we get back even a billion years and we have the whole inside of the planet molten. Uh, we know we have basically tectonics like the present at the time. We have to crank up the heat flow over double the bulk silicate earth record before we get an acceptable thermal history where the planet uh, starts out hot at what we know its age to be, or really the age after the more impact. So we got two things here. Two assumptions that sound very good, that the mantle controls the rate of plate tectonics, and we have this good estimate, uh, uh, heavy constraints from cosmic chemistry, heavy constraints from what we can sample from the interior of the Earth. Both cannot be right at the time. Uh, we either have to have the radioactivity estimate uh, uh, low by over a factor of two, uh, there will uh, soon be neutrino detectors, anti-neutrinos from radioactive decay in the Earth, so we will know the absolute radioactive heat generation. Uh, we will know the absolute abundance of uranium and thorium in the Earth, and uh, we'll be able to uh, check to see if uh, uh, what is right. Uh, the alternative is, is this elegant assumption that the model uh, big, we have big slabs sinking into a huge mantle is wrong and that the plates really control the rate on the Earth. Uh, if that is the case, uh, the, the assumption that Lenardic uh, made could possibly correct frictional control uh, or uh, we have uh, the alternative here uh, that we have uh, control by the bending and a yield stress. Okay, uh, the ridge push force, it's relative, uh, given it already, relatively easy to derive. Uh, we cannot have the vertical pressure in a floating object and in a surrounding fluid uh, equal to the horizontal stress in, uh, in both. Uh, viewing this in terms of work, if we have if we had the solid here that was buoyant, it would spread out like oil over water. Uh, in the case of the Earth, the ridge is weak, so we have a buoyant, weak fluid, and we have a strong, uh, dense lithosphere, so the lithosphere will be put into compression. Mathematically, the stress resultant, the stress times the thickness of the lithosphere, uh, is equal to this triangle. Uh, that you form by plotting the vertical stress in both objects. The vertical and E here uh, is the elevation of our block. Uh, the plates are in compression on the Earth. We know this from interplate earthquakes. So we have the possibility that this ridge push force. If we want uh, to go to Europa, we have actually the situation I've drawn here to get a, a simpler analogy. Uh, the thinnest ice on Europa is the weakest, uh, so we have a weak fluid uh, against a strong uh, buoyant solid, so the uh, thick ice, the high elevations in Europa will be in this membrane tension. Okay, uh, we can uh, uh, balance uh, a yield stress against uh, this ridge uh, 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 push uh, stress acting uh, uh, through the planet and uh, in that uh, case uh, we get the thickness of the lithosphere 
uh, scales to 1 over gravity. Uh, the heat flow will scale to 1 over the lithosp old lithosphere thickness. So in that case, we get heat flow scaling to gravity and that we have uh, plate tectonics by this mechanism on the super-Earth uh, where we get Earth-like temperatures uh, throughout its history, and it basically uh, behaves like the Earth does, uh, where it has a lithosphere of thinner thickness, uh, but the same pressure at the base. If we express everything in terms of pressure, things work very simply. So this, uh, the assumption here is that the bending of a slab rather than the, the uh, slip on uh, vector. Okay, uh, back uh, to uh, the friction. Again, uh, we get the result in terms of material properties. It doesn't, and we can't say anything uh, from that about the relationship uh, to size, but it, a tune model like the O'Neill and Renardic one will just give plate tectonics on an object, on a large object, and on an Earth sized object, and not give plate tectonics on a big one or a small one. And this is, again, the material property, again, reminding us that we need a very low stress friction, coefficient of friction. We don't really understand why the coefficient of friction is low on the Earth. We understand qualitatively, but certainly not quantitatively. Okay. Uh, we've gone through, I basically, uh, the Valencia et al. model is model-wide. Uh, driven flow by the, effectively by the slab. Uh, the O'Neill and Lenardic is friction balancing ridge push force. And we can see where we come from, but we can't really extrapolate. Okay. Uh, let's uh, see about geochemical cycles. Uh, we can have uh, uh, plates. Uh, works nice on the Earth. If we're lucky enough to get plates, things work fine. If we have a volcanic planet, we get very vigorous geochemical cycles. We have very reactive material erupting to the surface. Uh, we get hydrated, carbonated material melting at depth. Uh, we get something that kind of looks like the Earth. In fact, scientists have claimed the Archean of the Earth may have behaved this way rather than strictly having plates. If we have a stagnant lid planet, we can get that in two ways. The thickness of continental crust uh, is such that a cut volume of it, we have big planets where a lot of material to make crust covers the whole planet. Or we can get in this uh, friction-dominated regime uh, where we get uh, uh, something that may have some plate tectonics, but it's sluggish, can't transport the heat, uh, so we have a hot interior. Uh, the stagnant lid... Uh, heat flow works okay uh, because for it to get operated, it works like the parameterized convection result that I had before. Uh, we have to have the interior of the planet quite hot uh, to get the heat out of a super Earth or even an Earth sized planet. Uh, so we still get volcanism. Uh, we get it like uh, more, maybe more like hotspot volcanism or isle volcanism. Uh, but uh, we still have volcanism. We still get a perfectly good geochemical cycle. Affect the details of what we get, but not affect what we get overall. Okay. Uh, if we uh, uh, use EO, it's not a direct analog because gravity is not important there. And actually, uh, behavior closer to stagnant lid or slab-driven convection will work for a large planet. Uh, that the inside of the planet must flow because the inside is not going to be molten. The deep inside uh, planet with large gravity, large pressure at depth, and uh, will basically get convection where the rate of the convection, a stagnant lid or a, or a classic parameterized convection formula will get close to the right result. The volcanism gets the heat out the last little bit through the lithosphere, but it's not the rate-limiting step uh, like it is on EO, uh, where the gravity causes the pressure to just slightly increase the depth. Uh, we could totally melt a silicate planet 
and get material out. We're going to get ultramorphic material like olivine we'll get in uh, alkaline ocean, or we could uh, remelt hydrous material and get more granitic magmas. We could end up uh, with the crust of the planet melting at its base and just simply that acting as our heat transfer mechanism. Uh, we know that this has not happened in the last 3.8 billion years, uh, probably the last 4.2 or 4.3, uh, where the interior hot, uh, was hot enough that we had continuous melting everywhere at the base of the continental crust. Uh, we uh, know that uh, simply because where we start to see rocks at 3.8, uh, we're not getting continuous volcanics coming out of the interior, but rather we're seeing uh, regular sedimentary rocks. In the zircon suites, we see peaks of activity and peaks of quiescence. In the ancient zircon suites, just like we do now, there are a little bit, peaks are a bit closer together. Uh, we couldn't observe peaks that were a billion years apart when we only have uh, 500 million years of record, but we still have periods of quiescence and periods of activity uh, rather than continuous melting at the base of the crest. Uh, the stagnant lit volcanism, again, we have just a small layer that's not that has viscosity like the interior actually convecting, leads to the interior being hot, as I've already mentioned. Uh, okay, we can compute ocean depth. We make the assumption that most of the water uh, in the planet, or at least much of it, ends up in the ocean. Uh, on the Earth, uh, one of the paradigms is that the Earth's uh, mantle uh, can only take so much water uh, if the subduction zone tries to send down too much water, we get melting at the island arc. The island arc volcanic comes up. We get an eruption like Mount St. Helen, and the uh, water is back at the surface. This is that we have something like a coal trap in an old refrigerator. This is a water trap that the whole mantle has to eventually pass through the ridge axis in the subduction zone. So we have a sluggish system. Uh, but that the water gets back out at the subduction zone. There are uh, various things that are basically pre-plate uh, reasoning that claim that you can get much more water in the mantle, uh, but this is basically the only hypothesis that really fully includes plate tectonics that may not necessarily be correct, uh, but at <coughs> least there. Uh, with a little bit of geometry, the ocean depth scales with gravity, uh, the height of the topography, again, using the scaling relationships, the driving uh, force uh, from the buoyancy of the ridge scales inversely with gravity. If we have a small ocean, it will protect uh, against a small asteroid, yet if a big enough asteroid it's uh, to vaporize the ocean. It takes forever for it to rain out at the greenhouse threshold, and we sterilize any subsurface residuum. There's no subsurface residual. Uh, uh, the ocean crust is thin, but the water is deep. These kind of cancel each other out. A uh, big asteroid impact, a moderately big one, may actually assume metal. If we had a dry super-Earth where the ocean crust is thin, then it would be easy to exhume metal. Uh, we end up uh, with lots of material to exhume continents. Uh, this is just Gauss's law uh, for water. We have the uh, area of the planet scared, the thickness of the ocean, the density of the water is equal to the concentration of water in the planet times the mass of the planet, and we solve for this and we get a proportionality to gravity, inversely proportional to the density of water, which is a material property. Uh, we don't really know what the concentration of water is in super-Earth. If anything, it's going to be easier to accrete volatiles on a big object rather than a small one. Too much volatiles gives us Neptune, so there's going to be a limit uh, to this. Uh, but if we just take this at, at first order, uh, we're likely to end up with water world on a super-Earth. 
where I could, we have water world Europa in our own solar system. We don't have an Earth-sized water world. But considering a water world uh, is worth doing even if we don't find a super Earth one because we may well find an Earth-like one elsewhere. Okay. Uh, we have uh, processes that scale to gravitational potential. And one of the processes on a super Earth is going to be it's very hard for hydrogen to get out, and we may end up with a hydrogen-rich atmosphere ra rather than uh, a strongly reducing atmosphere where CO2 is a trace constituent uh, rather than abundant one. Uh, the direct effects of a super-Earth are dead, uh, boring. Microbes are really not affected directly by gravity. Uh, large organisms, if you've read any science fiction book, evolve to where they at. Uh, uh, water organisms, if they're large, are neutrally buoyant. And you go get stout organisms on land. Uh, the interesting thing here is the reducing atmosphere sediments dominated by carbon, organic carbon, rather than uh, by carbonates. And uh, we're also going to have uh, niches. Uh, we can't have both lots of hydrogen and lots of CO2 together on a climate planet. Uh, one of the first life forms to evolve on the Earth are methanogens, so they're relatively easily evolved. And uh, they will re react hydrogen with CO2. And if we have a, a reducing planet where hydrogen is dominant, uh, CO2 will become the, light, the limiting factor. Uh, photosynthesis would help you put in sun energy to help grab the CO2, uh, but you you're still have problems. Uh, there are other niches here. These are highly speculative, a shopping list. Uh, various ways here to use methane and water as a substrate uh, to make organic matter with different intermediate uh, steps. Uh, monoxide is a poison. Surprisingly, it's very good, high energy source, uh, very good for microbes that can make, out of it we can uh, make hydrogen uh, and organic matter. Uh, we can use CO2, uh, which is a short supply, or carbon monoxide for intermediate steps. Uh, we don't have organisms that do methane photosynthesis, at least is known on the Earth, uh, but uh, so this is speculation. Uh, the intermediate steps, if we got that far, are no longer speculation. Those work. Uh, what other choices we can store in oxygen? Um, dumb choice uh, is O2. That oxygen gets away from you. Uh, there's a possibility of, of uh, making oxidants by gathering light. Uh, we have organisms. Uh, that do photosynthesis using FEO. We have organisms that do photosynthesis doing sulfides. Uh, we have none that I know of that directly make hydrogen and store the oxidant for later use. Uh, we can get exotic. Uh, manganese is happily involved in photosynthesis on the Earth. Uh, there's apparently no uh, organism that makes a manganate or permanganate uh, in photosynthesis. Uh, there are organisms that make nitrate from nitrite and photosynthesis. Uh, we could uh, make nitrates easy to store. We could even store the organic matter and the nitrate together, make something like nitrocellulose. Uh, nothing does that on the earth. Uh, we can make uh, calcium or manganese, magnesium peroxide. Uh, these are, can be solids if we saturate the solution, particularly the calcium one, easy to store. Uh, it's used on the earth. Uh, it's not peroxides are heavily involved in biochemistry on the earth. Uh, organisms can make and destroy them. They don't use them as an energy resource as far as known. 
nothing gets its ATP, as far as known, out of peroxide. Uh, calcium peroxide is stable. It has industrial uses, uh, like cleaning, uh, like uh, putting a ro- on rice seeds in rice patties, uh, so the environment around the rice seed doesn't get too reduced in the dye. Animals, if we're going to get animals on our super earth, if we want ET uh, to call home, uh, uh, planet did not lose lots of hydrogen escape uh, when it was quite hot and accreting. Uh, we may end up with a reducing mantle. Uh, the Earth's uh, mantle is much more oxidized uh, than uh, the mantle of uh, Mars. It's m- slightly oxidized. The moon, uh, uh, which is reduced enough uh, that's close to equilibrium with iron nickel metal. Uh, the model of that is also reduced. So if we can't get hydrogen out uh, during the accreting, the model may stay reduced. At high temperatures, we'll still probably get a slight amount of uh, CO2 coming out of volcanoes, uh, just simply because you partition into all uh, the easily produced species at a high enough temperature. Uh, I've not a- attempted to calculate the- any of these. Okay, we have a question from Penn State. Hi, Norm. Jim Casting. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah. Um, so you you conclude that these super Earths will have reduced atmospheres uh, with lots of methane. You know that's true on giant planets, but those atmospheres are infinitely deep, essentially, so that methane is reformed at depth. These atmospheres, if they're if the planets are habitable, are not that deep. It's not that easy to make methane in the atmosphere, but it is easy to destroy it photochemically. I mean, what's the source for the methane? Uh, the, the source for the methane would be hydrogen reacting with CO2. Again, what, whether that can occur abiotically, there are other source of the uh, methane would be that we have very vigorous tectonics of any of the methane haze. Uh, falls to the surface. Uh, the materials very soon, if it's not eaten, is going to get subducted. Uh, we're, we're subducting uh, material into a hi- presumably hydrous mantle, uh, so we should get some methane back. If you heat up our organic matter hot enough, it cracks it. Right, so I think one probably should look at it kinetically because. Uh, you know, if you've got hydrogen escaping to space, probably coming from water, that gives you a source of oxygen, not free oxygen, but enough oxygen to oxidize some of that methane to CO2. So I'm not that convinced it would be that different from the early Earth, the a I, I agree with your scenario completely. Uh, for the Earth, uh, there's going to be a significantly high gravitational potential where it becomes difficult for hydrogen to get out. I, there's disagreement, uh, like with the uh, between Dave Catling the, the, and with the TNL paper, uh, on whether the efficacy of hydrogen escape even uh, from the Earth. Uh, so I, I've basically taken an agnostic position there, uh, but recognize that we may get a reducing planet. So. Uh, we need to think about it, and I agree, kinetics, uh, considering what really happens in the atmosphere, and then throwing uh, relatively simple life forms into it is the right way to go. I just d- did the simplest gases I could think of uh, that would form if we had a reducing atmosphere. Okay, I agree. I've got Feng Chen visiting this week, so Feng, we need to do that calculation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, over and out. Can you have hands raised? Okay. Uh, do we have any questions here in NAI Central? We have a room full. Kevin's on late. Okay. Uh, you, uh, for the larger planet, if I talk about a super Earth, I have more, and I imagine that every parcel I bring to the surface from the mantle has a chance to differentiate. I will make the same fractional amount of continents as I did for an Earth. So that was in my model. Right. And so I have uh, the surface to volume ratio will give me a larger amount of continent at the surface. 
plus, because the gravity is higher, the continent must be thinner because of the, the pressure force. Yeah, it'll, so, sp it'll spread out and cover the whole yeah, surface. Spread out and cover the whole surface. So the picture you've drawn is of an ocean-covered planet with a continental uh, uh, sea crust. Is that correct? Uh, yes. That doesn't sound anything like it. Uh, a couple things here. The, we don't know the efficacy which the continent will get resubducted. We have more material to make it. If we end up, in that case, we'll end up uh, with probably a continental volcanism-dominated uh, planet with some basaltic volcanism that makes it up through. So uh, if we, uh, if we, uh, if we, uh, we all planets go, We'll have the planet covered with volcanoes, yes. Yeah, but all that rich volcanic soil will be on the bottom of the ocean. Yes, we will not get shale. We will not get fall mountains. If you want something like the Appalachians, the aliens there will have to uh, put on their low gravity suit and travel to the Earth. We will not. At this, we will not get the uh, basic classes of sedimentary uh, rocks. We will not get organisms. Uh, that evolved to do uh, soil weathering will have some organisms that evolve uh, uh, to weather the whatever rock they find on the base of the ocean. But we'll, we'll still have things recycled, but we uh, we'll get a little if any land. We may end up with the continental crust getting a chromatiatic volcanism can get through and bury it. It may get swamped and get subducted. So. Uh, they're both enemies for it here, but this rind of continental crust and the, and the ocean uh, is uh, definitely a possibility, a possibility that will have geochemical cycles, but not plates. We have a question from Jack Lissauer. If you made the super Earth from generally more refractory material, so you had a reasonable amount of water compared to Earth and less potassium, what would be what would it be like? Uh, most of the current heat flow comes from the uranium and thorium. So if you if you make it more refractory, you'll get more of that. You'll lose a little bit of potassium, so the radioactivity will be just a bit hotter. The radioactivity declines by a factor of a few over the planet's age. Uh, so I think it'll have a, a modest effect if we end up getting uh, uh, we, uh, very little uh, material to make uh, crust, but part of the crust is aluminum and calcium, which is silica, which we have, all, if so I have plenty of. We'd end up with something that's more like a plagiar granite, the granite yeah. formed at the mid-ocean ridge axis, a sodium granite uh, than a potassic granite. Again, going to affect uh, details, uh, uh, we, as long as we have some trace potassium, that will be available as a biological element. That almost all the potassium of the earth, even near the surface, is not in living organisms. We have the Amazon or Orinoco region where the soils are almost quantitatively depleted of potassium, yet uh, organisms, including people, live there. Do we have another question at Art? Hi, Norm. This is Dave again. Um, I had a question. So the idea is that maybe the super Earth would be rather like the Hadean Earth, but maybe persisting for a longer period of time in that state. But then the flip side of that is that the Hadean Earth might be rather like the super planet in the sense that uh, you'd have this pervasive ocean. So do you think there actually is some insight for the nature of the Hadean Earth in this? I think so, that it's uh, we. Uh, might not uh, has been uh, probably not as reducing on the Hidean Earth. We probably did not get a pervasive worldwide uh, continent, even though people have argued that we uh, did. That's seems just from mass balance unlikely. Um, and uh, we uh, may have well had, had a at least a period in the Archean 
something where it was dominated by volcanics uh, rather uh, than uh, by plates. But in the D in particular, people have even argued that uh, for the Archean. Uh, we get surface weathering heavily by 3.8 since there's uh, well-preserved uh, shales with sedimentary structures by then. Uh, and arguments from the zircons that we had some superficial weathering at uh, 3 3 or 4 3 or so. So, uh, not a complete analog, but tectonically somewhat of an analog. The Earth gets hot, en hot enough inside uh, and had enough uh, heat law, radioactivity, uh, plate tectonics, uh, the simple form is no longer a um, mechanism for losing the heat. Kevin? Yeah, one last question. Uh, just a quick one on uh, a point, really, about uh, hydrogen escape. Is that if you're in the limit of diffusion, limited hydrogen escape, which is the will be the general state of thing mm -hmm. after this initial yeah. set, uh, that's governed by buoyancy. And so the bigger the gravity, the more diffusion limit escape you get. It goes the opposite direction right. of gravity holding onto the hydrogen. Rather, it's the buoyant force that's separating the hydrogen from the rest of the atmosphere. Yep. And so you actually get more hydrogen escape for a given amount of hydrogen in the atmosphere if there's more gravity. Okay. So not necessarily intuitively the way you think. Okay, I may be wrong. I get Jeb or somebody's group needs to do this. Jim needs to do this. Jim needs to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is something that... <laughs> Come on, get at it now, Jim. You've got a computer there. Fun I think needs it's to do this. I think it's worth... <laughs> uh, worse, uh, even if it's not the super Earth, worth considering what a very reduced end of a planet would be. We have... We have Titan on our own solar system. It does not have a silicate... Uh, surface, but may well have a water or ocean. Uh, so if we go deep enough into Titan, uh, we start to approach these conditions, even though uh, the inside is probably not extremely volcanically active. Okay, Jim, you have your assignment. Yep. Bung, do you want to say anything about that? Well, I'd love to do that, but uh, I need a, the, some kind of support to do. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I've got my assignment. <laughs> okay, do we have any other hands raised, Marco, in WebEx? There we go. Okay, if anybody would like to just jump in with a question, just open your mic and go ahead. Norm, this, uh, again, uh, the question about the Hadean on the Earth, do you think the more globally pervasive ocean is an interesting concept that has some merit to it? If it does, and if we uh, quote Ga uh, Galileo, there's kind of a, a subtle effect here uh, that the al albedo of the ocean is lower uh, than the albedo of the terrestrial deserts. Uh, apparently, this is visible <laughs> with the naked eye uh, when the uh, crescent moon uh, it is over uh, the terrestrial deserts. Uh, the earth shine is brighter than when it's over the ocean. This is in Galileo in the dialogues. Uh, so this is at least a partial uh, way uh, around the weak young sun paradox is that a mostly ocean covered uh, a planet would absorb more of the sunlight rather than reflect it. Uh, and uh, there's also a daisy world thing here for the Earth. If we have a anoxygenic, probably iron-based photosynthetic microbial mat covering the planet's desert crust has a low albedo compared to reflective sterile deserts. Uh, uh, the Egyptians have grazed goats. They've been able to get rid of the desert crust in the Sinai, and it's two degrees uh, centigrade lower than the Israeli Sinai, uh, where they uh, do not allow overgrazing by goat. So you, you can end up with this daisy world uh, situation where the microbial mats will spread, warming the temperature of the planet, and do they cover enough of the planet 
that they get it warm enough that they're limited by desiccation, and then this uh, stable buffer of temperature uh, will occur at the point of desiccation at the warm end of the daisy world uh, rather than the cold freezing end. So there uh, is a, a potential gian like mechanism here. I, I think uh, if there's a work of Blair Hedges on the family tree of light, uh, some evidence that cyanobacteria uh, evolved on land from soil bacteria and, and evolved from an ecosystem that originally it was doing anoxygenic uh, photosynthesis. So probably fairly early on, before 3.8, uh, we had the continents covered uh, by these micro pervasive microbial uh, mats. Uh, anoxygenic photosynthesis, getting the iron out, is a big prize. You need four irons to make one organic uh, uh, carbon. Uh, so we may have had an ecosystem that would have evolved and eventually uh, ended up with the soil bacteria. The cyanobacteria would evolve uh, to be able to inhabit uh, low iron regions that were the fault of the eventual weathering, melding, and tectonics. Low iron granites, low iron shales, low iron quartzites. Uh, where there would be a strong selective pressure for an organism with that ability. Uh, you know, and the uh, kind of evidence for this is that the cyanobacteria uh, seem to be related uh, to bacteria that are uh, originally and still primarily inhabit land, that they would have evolved probably combining two organisms that have the ability inadvertently to make a little bit of oxygen and when it gets the ability to make a lot, of the, any bit more becomes valuable. Uh, each oxygen you make, that means you uh, don't need four irons, which is a big deal when, you, when you're iron limited. In the ocean, there'd be iron and sulfide around, uh, so the, it becomes less advantageous to do anoxygenic uh, photosynthesis. You, you're producing an oxidant that you don't immediately get back yourself. It's not a, does not become a storehouse of energy until it becomes uh, uh, beyond uh, 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 a minute quantity in the air. If you produce ferric iron that stays around, uh, you know, the microbial mat, you, you get benefit from that, or your close clonal relatives benefit from the oxidant that you've just made if you can do the reverse reaction. Any more questions? Okay, then let me uh, remind you that the uh, this seminar will be archived. It'll be available and up on the NAI website probably in about three, four days, certainly by next week. And uh, anybody who missed it this time or who wants to hear it again will have the opportunity to in perpetuity. Uh, and once again, the next NAI Director Seminar will be given by Jack Shostak of Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, and that will be on Monday, November 3rd, same time, same channel. And one last uh, opportunity for questions to Norm. Going once, going twice, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you all for attending. See you in a few weeks.